This lecture is going to come cover some fundamental ideas in stand dynamics, and it follows on the tales of a solid understanding of forest succession outside of forestry. So if you started with a solid understanding of how forests progress through time and change through time outside of a forestry uh, context, but if you're starting with that foundation, then this would just build on that foundation and take us into a space where we can kind of consider uh, how forestry interacts with succession and how as a forester you might think about stand dynamics or changes in um, stand structure through time. So to begin with, let's talk about stand dynamics. So I'm going to use a series of classic figures here that come from a variety of different textbooks um, dealing with silviculture or the, the uh, science of, uh, of growing uh, forests. The basics of stand dynamics are often represented in terms of age structure diagrams or cross-section diagrams for forests. So for example, in the slide that we have here, we have an even age stand at the very top. You can say, see that the diameter distribution curve for this even age stand is almost normal. There's just a, a, single, um, a single curve, a single peak associated with the average DVH. In the, next, in the next image, we have um, a balanced or an uneven age stand where we have trees of all sorts of different sizes all clustered together. And because of this, our DBH distribution diagram shows a large number of small trees tapering off to a small number of large trees, which is uh, also classic. Then we can also think of our stand diagrams in terms of uneven or irregular age stands where uh, we have all sorts of peaks throughout. We can think of a typical old growth or um, even age stratified structure, uh, which is com which will have kind of a similar form here with a, what we call an inverse J shape to the DBH distribution diagram so that we have a large number of small trees tapering off to a small number of large trees. And then there's a typical treated stand scenario where we might have a two age stand where older trees are left, some older trees are left and then underplanted with younger trees. Um, this two age stand distribution is also common following wildfires. When we think about canopy structure, it can help to think about dominance in terms of uh, emergence. Uh, emergence here misspelled, notice the A that should be an E. Uh, but we have emergent trees, trees that um, emerge above the canopy of others. They might be uh, small in number, but when they do get above the canopy, um, they can dominate just a small area. These are especially common in the tropics. You can have dominant trees or wolf, which are different than wolf trees, which might be uh, standing alone dominant trees from a prior disturbance. Um, then we can have co-dominant trees that are not dominating the canopy, but they might be up in the same vertical stratum. We have intermediates, and then we have suppressed or overtop trees, which are very common in the Pacific Northwest. As we go through stand development, we're going to talk in terms of four stages. Now, these are artificial stages, but they've been useful for foresters for a long time in terms of just thinking about the stages that a forest is in, in terms of the major pressures on individual species and the major limitations to development. So here we go, four stages. Okay, in terms of succession in the Pacific Northwest, our primary succession environments often look something like this, um, which uh, challenges actually the notion of what primary succession is. There, this is a lava flow on Mackenzie Pass in Oregon, um, and this lava flow is not that old. Um, but what we can see is that there are some patches of older trees in the middle of this lava flow from some areas that were not impacted very much by the lava flow. Um, so that that's a bit of a uh, fascinating piece of trivia. But regardless, we think of succession as starting with bare ground. As succession develops, we get small trees and um, patchy vegetation that can develop and begin to thin in 
uh, in the stand. We get to a stage in which the trees are crowded and they be begin to self thin. After they've thinned for a while, we get to a stage in which the canopy has opened back up and the understory starts to reemerge. Diversification in this case following um, that reemergent understory can be tremendous and we end up with a multi-layered, multi-age stand in the Pacific Northwest if we're going all the way to old growth conditions. So let's start first with the stand initiation phase. The stand initiation phase has, a, um, you know, you can have a high amount of species diversity in terms of vascular plant species when a stand is just initiating, but not all of those will be trees. And of course, this photo doesn't really demonstrate that. We're just seeing a, a field of uh, cut trees and debris. There's almost no vertical structure. Uh, site dominance isn't established. And for this reason, you kind of have the most, as a forester or a silviculturalist, you have the most flexibility in terms of determining the future stand conditions uh, when you're starting from zero. You're building the foundation for the forest. So the foundation of the forest is being built. You have an expanding range of ages as this gets older. Plants are very sensitive to microenvironment given their age and relative size. And growing space is not completely occupied everywhere until the end of this phase. Some foresters have really emphasized that this is a time, if there's ever a time to apply herbicides in a uh, uh, forest, this is the time because weed competition can really affect the growth of, of trees in this open field scenario. Other foresters and silviculturalists have really argued that by leaving debris or leaving shade or leaving certain numbers of trees at this stage, you can affect the development of uh, the next generation of trees significantly um, and therefore uh, reducing the need to apply any sorts of herbicides to control exotic species or invasive species. Uh, but you should know uh, that this is where people generally think about applying herbicides and the reason is generally associated with reducing competition um, to establish trees as soon as possible into cleared areas. Okay, um, just a, a picture there of a forester who's been a proponent of, um, of applying herbicides. Here we're looking at a stand diagram, a vertical cross section of a forest and a stand diagram for the hypothesized diameter distribution for trees within a forest. And this could happen after a wildfire, after a blowdown, or after a clear cut. The, these are three of the major ways in which forest succession is restarted in our region. Of course, there's an even larger way in which forest succession is restarted in our region, uh, and that's volcanic eruption. And so especially along the Cascade Range in the Pacific Northwest, we have a number of forests that are restarted uh, every once in a while by uh, an explosion uh, of a nearby volcano and that can uh, severely change uh, forest structure, obviously. So regardless though, as forests begin, we're gonna have that distribution of a large number of really small stems as forests get established, which can take some time. Following that, the next phase we're gonna talk about is the stem exclusion phase. The stem exclusion phase is the phase in which trees start shading each other so severely that the less successful trees in the early stages of establishment start to get outshaded by their neighbors. If you don't believe this is a thing, uh, just think about the last time you uh, grew some carrots or saw somebody's carrot patch. You'll see some carrots get very large and some get very small unless you go in and thin them. So the self thinning phase in a forest allows some remaining trees to get very large. This, um, begins with a fully occupied site. So this applies to a site where the establishment of the tree cohort has been extensive enough to cover the entire site. It of course is not gonna apply if we have more patchy establishment of individual trees. 
we have gain or loss of growing space by individuals and that drives success. Um, and the winnings from this phase are carried into the future. And so whoever does well in this phase is gonna um, into the future continue to do well. We say that mortality in this phase is guided by what we call the three halves power law or negative three halves power law. Um, and so in the negative three halves power law suggests that there is a decline in the average size uh, or in the average number of trees associated with an increase in the average size of, uh, of trees in a stand. And this applies to a number of organisms, not just trees, uh, but it, it's applicable here. Our diameter distribution dis uh, diagrams are gonna start to look somewhat like um, we have that single peak in um, abundance of individual trees and it's gonna start to move over to the right on our diagram and move down as the number of trees shrinks and the size of trees increases. The physiological response to light can drive a lot of what happens in this phase. And in multi-species stands, this is really important. You'll notice this with the live crown ratio where live crown ratios for Douglas fir that are in this stage will start to get very small. They'll start to get close to 0.3 or less. However, shade tolerant species such as hemlock and cedar in the presence of the same stands will continue to have live crown ratios that are large and they may actually do fairly well in low light conditions. So here's a graph just showing um, differences in light and uh, photosynthetic response curves for different species, Douglas fir and black, and the white boxes are hemlocks. And in this case, you can see that in different parts of the canopy, even when you're at the very top of the canopy, we have hemlocks that are not responding as strongly to high light values as our Douglas firs, but in low light conditions, hemlocks are equal to Douglas firs or sometimes even more productive, the more photosynthetically active. So the management implications of this stage is this is where foresters often wanna come in and do a pre-commercial thin. They wanna come in and, and thin the stand before this mortality occurs. And the intention there is to capture the mortality that we see here in these small diameter trees before they become sticks on the ground. Um, you go in and you go ahead and remove them. The, this might be, not be a commercial sale. Um, it's very likely that nobody would want uh, these in a, in a uh, forestry context. So that this thinning is simply to release space for the remaining trees. Um, and get that red curve, that diameter distribution curve to move lower and farther to the right faster. Um, but there are some selection implications. If you as a forester go in and you select who is the healthiest tree, uh, you are making a selection. You're making an evolutionary uh, choice. You're making a choice that is gonna affect the long-term life of the stand. Um, and uh, so uh, you wanna be right. Following the stem exclusion phase, we tend to have a transition phase. And this is where enough trees have died back that we get the understory to reinitiate. Um, individual trees, when they fall over, can leave, of course, large canopy gaps. And if you get enough trees uh, leaving these large canopy gaps, then you open up understory uh, to come in. Um, so in this phase, new growing space becomes available. Um, light especially becomes more available. And there's more variability in micro environment. It's changing back to, it's starting to look more like what it will look like eventually in an old growth stand. Our shade tolerant species tend to come back in in this phase in the Pacific Northwest. And many of our forests on um, the evergreen, in the evergreen forest reserve look a lot like this. So there's an image of one of these forests here uh, where we have a large number of shade intolerant Douglas firs dominating the canopy, but then we have a number of shade tolerant species that are coming in in the understory and we have a very tall understory. There's some talk in this age forest of coming in and accelerating old growth transition or um, old growth development. And there's also some talk about how diseases, pathogens or disturbances at this stage in development can actually accelerate 
forest succession. So rather than moving forest succession back when you get uh, a high wind storm, wind throw, uh, root rot patch, you can actually move succession forward because the trees that die are those standing, sun-loving, shade intolerant species. And the trees that tend to survive are the low stature, shade tolerant species that are in the understory that are just waiting for the overstory to die so that they can take over and become dominant. So in that way, by wiping out portions of the overstory, you can actually accelerate development towards climax forest conditions. And we have the old growth phase, which begins with uh, completed reinitiation mosaic. We have a uh, higher diversity again, uh, the highest diversity the stand has seen since it was a clear cut. A clear cut is probably our maximum diversity. And then as we get to old growth, we're back to uh, high diversity again. This can take centuries. Some people claim that through silvicultural manipulation, they can get there in fewer than 80 years in the Pacific Northwest. Large gaps opened up by individual trees take over as the dominant disturbance type in these forests. And so we've gone from large scale disturbance, such as the ones that created the conditions for stand initiation in the first place, to small scale disturbances being the driving force on diversity and structure in these forests. So trees toppling over play a large role in creating vertical heterogeneity and diversity. There are a lot of ways to categorize the structure of these forests. And so we'll go back to our tried and true cross-sectional cross diagrams and diameter distribution diagrams. You can see that our shade tolerant species are coming in with an inverse J. And this red hump is showing that our diameter is getting larger with smaller numbers of trees in that large category as we go through time. And eventually our sun loving Douglas fir uh, or um, pioneer species start to die out. As we get to a really old distribution, we have complete loss of that pioneer cohort, those sun loving trees that began the stage. And we have finally reached what we call climax forest conditions, where the same trees that are dominating the stand are dominant in the reproductive uh, population, in the reproducing population. Um, and so our stand distribution diagram starts to look like an inverse J. So along the way, we have seen multiple versions of these stand diameter distribution diagrams that predict the progress of this forest uh, through time. A few notes about old growth. It's important that these diagrams we just talked about talked about progression towards climax conditions or a kind of hypothetical climax condition. This is very different than old growth. So old growth, uh, we should think of as more of a kind of a political um, distinction. It's the kind of thing that you know when you see, uh, but it doesn't have an excellent ecological definition the way the climax forest does. So along the way, we can define our forest as old growth anywhere from you know 100 years to maybe 600 years in the progression that we just outlined. Additionally, the old growth phase looks really different in different forest types. Here are some images from the Olympic Peninsula. Um, some of them I took, another one comes from another site. Um, in these forests, we have really large trees. We actually have a really low amount of understory. Here are some images from historic images from different forest types around the country. First, a saw palmetto, a uh, longleaf pine stand, um, and in that photo, uh, we have some heavy saw palmetto understory, um, bowls that are clear of vegetation for uh, a long distance before the canopy uh, fills out uh, by longleaf pine. In the next, in the center photo, we have a ponderosa pine forest, in this case um, on the Kaibab National Forest in Arizona. Um, this is an old image, and you can see an open understory with, uh, with uh, trees that are widely spaced apart in a kind of a park-like setting. These are all old growth and the image on the far right is going to look more like what we're familiar with in the northwest. This old growth, growth condition is characterized by large trees, large woody debris, structural heterogeneity, so the canopy is multi-layered and critical. There is a ladder of canopy going all the way from the base of the floor up into the forest canopy, one of the critical components to old growth definitions in the Pacific Northwest that differs dramatically from what you'd expect in these more fire uh, adapted 
regular fire, regular low intensity, high frequency fire adapted systems such as ponderosa pine and um, longleaf pine.